Uh, so, good morning everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Carolyn Shred. Uh, Carolyn Shred uh, is a senior lecturer at um, uh, Mount Holyoke uh, University or college, college, uh, college uh, in Massachusetts and she also teaches at Smith College in Massachusetts. See, she uh, specializes in French and feminist studies and she's a translator, and today she's going to talk about the translations that she's done of uh, Catherine Malabou's works, uh, the last, uh, the latest of which uh, is uh, circulating among students. Okay, Carolyn, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Sardin, for this invitation. Thank you uh, to the Climas Intersection. Uh, series and uh, to the organizers, administrators, technicians, everyone who has made this possible. Uh, I was just saying this morning I was in a classroom for the first time since March 13th, 2020, uh, and now I'm back in an amphitheater, which is where I was uh, uh, on that date uh, so long ago. So it's really, really nice, even nicer to be here with you today. Um, and also to make my first visit to uh, to the Université de Bordeaux and to Bordeaux. Um, so thank you very much. At the moment, this is my first sabbatical. Uh, and I know many of you are in gender studies, so let me just make the point why it's my first sabbatical. Uh, since I started teaching in 1995, even though uh, I had two kids, they're academic year babies, they had to be born in the summer because I had to go back to teaching, no congé de maternité or anything. Uh, that's the reality of a lot of uh, women's work. Um, so this sabbatical is all the more uh, precious. Um, let's see, okay. Uh, let me start by saying, uh, so the title of this talk is The Pleasures of Translating Catherine Malabou. Um, and I should, uh, I, I wondered actually if, uh, it's very interesting to me to know to what extent she's known and uh, in, the, in France, not known, not known, and, and which is an interesting translational phenomenon. Is there anybody who's read any of her work? A little bit, <laughs> because, which is fine, it's totally, I, I prefer honesty, and, and what I find very interesting is that I know that her reception in France uh, was difficult, uh, and for that reason she actually, um, did most of her teaching at the University, or a lot of her teaching at the University of Kingston and the University of uh, uh, Irving in the, um, in the US and other institutions in the US, where she's uh, much better known. So it's often an interesting phenomenon where you have uh, a French thinker who goes abroad essentially to, to have a certain reception. Uh, sometimes the places where we come from are not the most receptive to us. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, Let's see, I'm going to uh, move on here. Uh, the first text that I translated by Malibu, I've been translating her since uh, 2007, and uh, the first one was an article which became in English, uh, An Eye at the Edge of Discourse, and in it she asked this question, what is it to see a thought, to see a thought coming? Um, and the thought that she was talking about in this context was her idea of plasticity. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about plasticity today. Uh, at that point, plasticity was emerging for her as a powerful tool for engaging our world, for understanding the world that we live in. I, I, would, I think I can say, maybe at least in, the, in an Anglophone context, that 20 years later, uh, plasticity has established itself as a highly productive contribution. Uh, she's written some 10 books on this and mobilized, the thought has been mobilized in many disciplines. In the US, um, I know in English departments she's appreciated, um, obviously in philosophy departments, but it's interesting to see in what places the thought gets picked up. Um, and uh, today, the, what I will be focusing on uh, is my own particular interest, which is the way that plasticity helps illuminate translation. Um, and it's not something that Malibu talks about herself. Uh, it was something that, an understanding that while I was translating, there's a part of your mind as a translator which is free. And while I was translating, uh, this was an understanding that I was developing 
uh, while doing her work. I was like, oh, she's, what she's writing about here, this is re relevant to what I'm thinking about and doing as well. Um, so let me just put up this next image. Uh, this is a, an art work by Sophia Wallace. Um, it is called uh, Adamas, and so um, it's a new form, maybe, which is unfamiliar, or maybe not to people in the room, and, and that's my next question. I've asked you about Nadapu herself, but I'd like to know, could, can anybody identify uh, what this 2013 sculpture uh, represents? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> uh, that might not have been obvious to everyone in the room. Um, and uh, in fact, according to Wallace, this is the first anatomically correct representation of a clitoris in the history of art, uh, which is quite a claim to fame. Um, and I wonder if anybody can think of any representations of penises, not to make an equation there, but maybe, maybe you can uh, think of, of uh, places in the history of art where that has uh, appeared. So I think this, this is underscoring the point uh, that the clitoris, uh, with the clitoris, we're dealing with a newly emerging vision uh, and along with it, a new thought, to go back to that link between seeing and thinking. Um, and to this end, uh, maybe to uh, just to help us think, I wanted to start with a two minute video presentation. It's made by an author, Rachel Gross. Um, her book, her research will be published in March 22, and uh, the name of her book is Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage. Um, okay, uh, merci. Yes, okay. merci bien. Okay, so just one second. We'll just watch this video for two minutes. You can find this on YouTube if you look up Rachel Gross. Is that the one? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, and let's take this off. Oh, yeah. Okay, and here we are again. Yeah, let's recognize the shape of the beginning. Okay, voilà. So this is from Scientific American. Do you recognize the shape above me? Kind of an alien, penguin, spaceship, maybe? Well, not exactly. Uh, it's something called the clitoris. You may have heard of it. It's had a lot of names throughout the ages. Little hill, little pillar, electric bell, or my personal favorite, the devil's teat. But all of these names seem to refer to something small and delicate, that little nub we all know and love. What they really fail to recognize is that the clitoris is an iceberg. About 90% of this organ is beneath the surface. So that nub is actually the glans clitoris, and you can think of it the same as the head of the penis. But beneath it, if you think of the entire organ, you've got these two teardrop-shaped bulbs and then you've got these two tapered arms that curve out to the sides and reach almost nine centimeters into the pelvis. The shape of the clitoris explains many things, including how female orgasm works and what the G-spot actually is. But you'll have to watch till the end of the video to figure that one out. The clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings, which is at least two to three times as many as the penis. Not that anyone's counting. So if all this seems familiar to you so far, then good for you, I salute you. But for the rest of us, you might be wondering why this isn't more common knowledge. Part of the reason is that Western culture, and that includes science, has long valued the penis and its every tremor more than the clitoris and its remarkable anatomy. After all, most of the scientists doing the investigating were men. But in a more practical sense, the penis is a lot easier to study and measure. It just kind of hangs out there, whereas the clitoris grows much more internally. It's more entwined with its surroundings it doesn't always announce its presence. So now it's time to dive into the history of the clitoris. Okay, voila. Uh, so we'll just stop there. If you're interested, you can go online and, and find the rest of the, the, uh, the video. Let's see. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so uh, obviously this is research that I've been doing while uh, translating this uh, latest book, uh, which is going around, uh, Le plaisir du passé, clitoris et pensé. Um, I have my copy here. I didn't send it round. I have to say, this is just a strange anecdote. When I got this book in the mail, it was soaking wet. I mean, I had to put it out on the window pane, on the windowsill for about three days until it dried out. I don't know why. 
I mean, I've never received a book in the mail, and I got a little note from the post office saying, we're really sorry, but that's how it turned up in my house in America. Um, so, uh, let's see. So the, the English title uh, I have is uh, Pleasure Erased, The Clitoris Unthought. Uh, the book should be out next year. Um, and we can talk about the, the translation of the title. What I'm planning to do now, so I have a sort of two-part talk here, uh, is an overview of the first five books uh, that I translated uh, as a grant uh, that prepared for this one. Um, I should mention that, that Malibu has mit written many more books um, translated into English by at least six other translators. And uh, I wrote to her, and on our last count, um, it, her work has been translated into 14 other languages, which are Spanish, German, Italian, Dutch, Japanese, Portuguese, Dutch, oh, no, I've got Dutch in here twice, that's interesting. Okay, Turkish, Finnish, Croatian, Norwegian, Swedish, Polish, and Farsi. Um, so uh, my dream is to have a, a, a conference of Malibu translators. We'll see if I can bring that to, to pass. Um, here's my, my plan. Here's my, my outline for what we'll do today. I, I'm going to start by talking about uh, the idea that I have of translation plasticity, how plasticity really helps illuminate translation. Then I will talk uh, in more detail about the sixth book, the recent translation and its pleasures. And then I will conclude briefly with um, the notion of moving towards a practice of clitoridian translation. So that's the, the outline and the plan. Let's see. Okay. So, as I said, over the course of translating Malibu, I've been increasingly entangled in think, talking about plasticity as a way of thinking about translation. Can I ask, is there anybody who is a, a translator or who is interested in translation here? Okay, all right. For those who are not, please bear with us, and please also remember, translation is the core of our activities as humans. Uh, so it is relevant to, to all of us, whether or not we, we think that it is uh, relevant. Um, uh, but some of the arguments that I'm making here may have less pertinence to you if you're not deeply involved in the discussions around tra translation, uh, if you're more in interested in the gender studies side. But big, a lot of connections to be made between the way that translation is considered and the way that we think of uh, the discourses in gender studies. So there, there is a, a deep connection there. Uh, and I would uh, assume my position as a feminist translator. I'm intervening. Uh, in um, and as a feminist activist via the means of translation. So let me just also frame it in that way to make it relevant to those of you who are uh, in the gender studies masters and who are trying to, uh, to see the connection between what I'm saying here and uh, your own particular interests. Um, so uh, Malibu is talking, of, uh, she, she draws this notion of plasticity from les arts plastiques, uh, from neuroplasticity, and I will add here the, the notion of translation. And she talks about the ability of molding or taking shape, uh, whether by bestowing form, receiving form, or destroying form. Those are all different ways in which form is uh, changed and managed. Um, okay. Um, so uh, let me see. In uh, the Greek, plasein is to give or to receive form. Um, and uh, the French connotations of plasticage are much less evident in, um, in English. Uh, plasticage, obviously the, you have the word plastique there, but so in, with plastic explosives, you have this destroying capacity, uh, along with the giving or receiving form. Uh, there is also biological plasticity. This is very important uh, to her thinking, and I think also to the, the relevance of what she's talking about here, uh, specifically in regard to uh, both regeneration and also bodily plasticity. So that's something that I think in gender studies is at the heart of the field at the moment, thinking about the, how our bodies are plastic. Um, let's see. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, one of the ways that we can think of a connection between uh, gender studies and, and translation is that translation has been typically thought of as a uh, secondary, as a derivative form 
uh, with an inevitable hierarchy between an original. Um, I think that that is still in commonplace uh, notions. It's still a dominant conception uh, of translation. Uh, we'll always look to the authority of the original text, for example. But plasticity helps us think of translation as something which is generative, regenerative, something inherent to the life of text. In other words, that, that there is a, it's closer to a life force. Um, and uh, if uh, anybody wants to explore this further, one text which might be useful is Laurie Chamberlain's. This was back in 1988. She wrote Gender and the Metaphorics of Translation. Um, in which she really tore apart the many ways in which the metaphors around translation reiterate a kind of gendered narrative. Okay. Um, I think also uh, I'd like to address, you know, in these times of climate crisis, I think we always have to be um, thinking in those th senses. And in some ways I felt, considering that I hate plastic, that it was somewhat ironic that I should be so engaged, and deeply engaged with this word plasticity. Uh, but I think there may be a homeopathic relationship between plastic and plasticity, uh, and that there is the capacity within plasticity to have a reparative, as I said, or adaptive, um, and an, even an eco-translation perspective. Uh, it's not something I'll talk about today, but I just wanted to mention that because I was worried about the toxicity within the term. Um, right. Uh, I should also put uh, into context here, now many of you are familiar with uh, Malabou, but maybe you've heard of Jacques Derrida um, and uh, his notion of deconstruction, the graphic trace. And the plasticity is really um, a uh, bold response to that. Uh, Malabou's uh, thesis director was Derrida. They went on to write books together. And um, she is making the, the argument that plasticity eclipses the graphic trace, which is the way that Derrida was thinking about difference, about the deferral of meaning. Uh, she argues that instead we need to uh, think about a plastic morphing in our time, that that is closer to uh, the realities and to the, the, the ways of thinking and the media and materials that we're working with. Um, so uh, I should say that uh, taking advantage of my role as translator, um, while I was translating these books and, and, and becoming familiar with her work, uh, I was also at the end of each one writing a preface, which are eventually um, somewhat sort of mini manifestos uh, for translation studies, uh, adopting Malibu's philosophical an analysis of plasticity as a way of rethinking uh, translation. So what I'm going to do right now is a kind of fast gallop through some of the ideas that I presented in, in these uh, prefaces. Um, and along with a uh, presentation of the books, you'll notice the, um, the difference between the very beautiful, sober, lovely texture of the French covers and the somewhat gaudy covers. Sometimes, I mean, some of them I like, I'm not keen on this one, uh, that we have on uh, the English versions. Um, so this is the first book that I translated, La Plasticité au Soir de l'Écriture. Um, and uh, let me just present here briefly then the, the ideas that came out of that first encounter. So one conventional idea about translation is fidelity. I think uh, the, that's the uh, commonplace concern is that the translations are not faithful. Um, and uh, faithful in the sense either of the meaning or an equivalent effect or uh, any other different, there's a whole range of things that you're meant to be faithful to. And there's this shared assumption that translation always happens with reference to an original. Um, so uh, the paradigm that seems useful here is the notion of the difference between elasticity, so something like a rubber band that you can stretch and you let go, it always goes back to the original, and plasticity. Um, and this is the, these were the two terms that I took out of this, uh, this work. Uh, so elasticity never leaves the origin of the source text. Um, and uh, the questions are, do we translate literally? Do we repeat uh, the text through its effects or through its function in the target culture or the source culture? Uh, do we allow for adaptation for other uh, transcreation or other interventions? Uh, how elastic can a translation be? That question is often asked. And my proposal is, we don't care about how elastic it is. What we want to think about is plasticity. That's what's interesting. Um, so we want to think about the becoming of the translation, how a text becomes 
uh, through its translations, and Derrida, to his credit, talks about the survival of the text, that how the text depends on a translation to survive. Um, so it's not entirely malleable, but it is, uh, it's not protean, but the, it, there is this generative activity. I'm trying to get rid of those awful metaphors around lost in translation. Um, and uh, we can define itself without relation to the claimed origin since uh, we could argue that the origin does not exist originally, right? So we can uh, make that claim and assume, therefore, the transformations that we are making um, as a form of formative engagement. So that's changing the, the, the frame and the paradigm in which we might think about translation. Uh, so at the end of my, my first uh, preface, I signed it Plasticienne Textuelle, um, uh, as a uh, textual artist. The next one that I did uh, is uh, Changer de Différence, uh, where um, Malabou is engaging with the feminine, with the question of philosophy, uh, and the concept that uh, changes originally again. So here she's really putting it, if you're interested in gender studies and wanted to read, uh, this text would be uh, the one that's probably most relevant <coughs> in that sense. Um, so we're not going to start with an origin, but rather with a change with becoming. Um, <clears throat> and um, in this model, translation is not a secondary process, it's foundational, it's where we start. Um, let's see. Uh, so that feminist distrust of binaries, uh, feminism has done a lot of work to, uh, to <clears throat> take binaries and binary oppositions apart, the original and the translation, um, has, is far too familiar, and um, this text helps us to think about how plasticity might be useful for uh, de uh, taking that apart. Let's see. Um, and so in this preface, uh, the questions that I were bringing up are questions around privileging the source and questioning the idea of neutrality, which is also a very dominant and resistant notion in translation uh, as the possibility of go or goal of translation. Um, okay. All right, on to the third, the third one, which is Ontologie de l'Accident. Uh, I actually, I love the, uh, the English cover here with this upside down horse. Uh, so my, essentially my intervention here uh, with this book, which really is an art articulated with the first one, because it's the destructive aspects of, of plasticity, uh, is to think about translation not as an accident, but as the becoming, the possibility of becoming of the text. Uh, that was the framework that I was trying to, to propose, um, where the condition of the accident is actually formative and necessary to the translation. All right. Uh, after that, we had a, a, a pretty hefty book, uh, Avant Demain, Epigenèse et Rationalité. Um, this book is engaging with Kantian philosophy and proposing uh, a biological process, epigenesis, uh, that is a process of cellular differentiation. So she's reading Kant's Critique of Pure Reason as an epigenetic development. Um, that was really useful and interesting for me because it allowed me to start thinking of translation as an epigenetic development of the text. So that would be a really different conception from a genetic understanding where uh, the text, um, where we would looking, we'd be looking for some sort of uh, origin and determining DNA, but instead through epigenesis, we're looking at the environment, the way that the context in which the translation is received and done is then determining what happens in the translation. So that seems really very uh, useful. After that, we had Métamorphose de l'intelligence, uh, uh, morphing intelligence. Um, and I know that I, I, I should, I have a note to myself, I know that I'm racing through all of these, and each of these books is obviously a dense uh, network of thoughts, uh, but just uh, allow, you know, just go along with uh, the ideas, hopefully, and then we'll have a little more time to talk in depth about uh, Le Plaisir et Passé. Um, this book I love because I think it's quite rare that we read an author who says, oh, I got it all wrong. But that's what she does in this book. She says, uh, she wrote a book, um, Que faire de, de notre cerveau? Uh, what should we do with our brain? Which is very popular. And 
10 years later, she came back to it and said that the claims that she made about um, a political vision that was essentially founded on a human freedom based on neuroplasticity, um, so she was sort of linking neuroplasticity and politics, uh, given the communication revolution that we're living in, uh, given um, our understanding of brain plasticity and also maybe from an eco perspective recognizing the human exceptionalism that was being argued for in that earlier book um, in the light of advances in, in artificial intelligence uh, she really needed to rethink that so here uh, que faire de leur cerveau bleu le cerveau bleu is the blue brain project which is essentially trying to uh, make an artificial uh, brain um, which would have creative potential uh, as well. So um, that was a, an important and interesting moment. Um, and in my preface here, I was playing with this, uh, why I translate so intelligently, uh, translating mentis in the era of Google Translate, obviously for translators, and this was a question that came up in our class this morning, what's the um, place of translation given artificial intelligence? Uh, and I think, I can still claim to do artisanal translation, although increasingly I do recognize the way that I interface with the forms of artificial intelligence. Um, so uh, what's the intelligence of translation within this new intellectual frame? Um, that is uh, one of the, the main questions. So at this point, I'm gonna move on to the second part of my talk. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope that having that wider context will be helpful for understanding uh, Malibu's work uh, more generally. Um, so this is the, the, uh, the current uh, book, the one that I'm working on, the one that I was proofing on the train on the way down here. Um, so it's not yet in print, it should come out next, next year. Um, but you do see here uh, both the, the French cover and the, the draft of the, um, the English cover. Um, let's see. Uh, and so this book really develops in the same, um, the earlier Changer de Différence, it's a sort of an update on that book from 2009, uh, looking at the feminist implications of plasticity and specifically honing in on the uh, phenomenon of the erased pleasure of what I'm calling the unthought clitoris. Um, so, let's see. Uh, to that end, uh, I ask the question, to think the clitoris, do we need to see it? Um, and uh, I should preface all of this, I realize that th with all of this talk of, of vision uh, throughout this talk, it's important to say that this vision is both the act of, of seeing, the, the physical act, but it's also uh, metaphorical and it also doesn't uh, deny um, those who are visually impaired from engaging with this thought. So the, the, uh, the color red has meaning and significance, maybe arguably even more so, to those who are visually impaired from those who are seeing red. So I did want to, in the context of this talk, where I'm talking a lot about vision, recognize that. Um, so uh, the question here is, what are we to do with that which is unthought because it is unseen? Um, and uh, but the difference is that whereas in uh, that first article I translated, it was an unthought idea, here we're talking about an unseen body, a body denied, uh, a body defaced by a long history of violent erasures, uh, including in the realm of visual art and representation, which is why in the course of this talk, I will be giving uh, quite a lot of presence uh, to uh, artists and the way that they are visioning the clitoris at this point. Um, so this argument is mobilizing a critique of what I'm calling unthinking as an active process that ensures that certain aspects of experience and knowledge are suppressed and rendered invisible. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So uh, while Malibu's philosophy of plasticity took its initial inspiration from Les Arts Plastiques. Um, the, this book, uh, she's writing about a topic which is universally uh, absent from representation, which is the clitoris. 
Um, and so along with both a lack of recognition of women artists and despite a relentless objectification of women's bodies throughout the history of art, none of this has uh, resulted in a picturing of clitorises. So on that ground, I think that this is really an important work. This is another work by Sophia Wallace uh, called Formless. Um, and you can see it's an installation here. Um, so uh, she's playing precisely with uh, this lack of artistic representation and confronting the, the dilemma of how do you represent the negative or that which does not exist, that which has been constantly erased, violated, destroyed, and denied. Um, oh yes, it is quite pale, so I hope you can see that better now. And I have another picture here that may help, um, along with a nice quotation uh, from Sophia Wallace saying, um, the clitoris exists in the negative space, cut out of the form itself. The invisible sculpture addresses negation and omnipresence by denying access to the form while reinforcing its existence. Um, so I think that, that her work is really tremendously important in this regard. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the way that this erasure is not just in the arts, but also extends to science and scholarship. So it was actually an Australian neurologist, Dr. Helen O'Connell, who started to explore this lack in medical education in 1998. And then in 2005, and I, I, it's sort of embarrassing, all these dates are so recent. Um, in 2005, she produced the first ever comprehensive anatomical study of this unknown body part, uh, which is the female sexual organ. Um, and whose function is, and this is an important point, whose function is not reproduction, but rather pleasure. And that's uh, in the title of uh, Malibu's book. So this sharp contrast between the invisible erased clitoris and the intention uh, that male anatomy has received is, and it's uh, the aesthetic glorification uh, of male sexual organs, the medical textbooks in which you'll find far more pages um, on these, and the endless discussions around this. This hyper-visibility uh, and the omnipresent representation that has dominated both culture and critique um, erases uh, a feminine, which is not a homologue. I think we, we have to be careful of making your equations and uh, between them, but an alternative mode of experience, knowledge, and aesthetics. Uh, and here we have, a, and maybe this is where people may have begun to be, have this form coming into their, uh, their consciousness here in France, because Odile Fulot uh, is a, a French researcher um, who's used O'Connell's work to create other visualizations, notably um, the, a 3D printed life-size model, um, which uh, she is holding here, uh, and she has a, a uh, website, Clit Info, which was launched in 2017. She's been very active uh, in trying to ensure that uh, French uh, school textbooks include images and representations of the clitoris so that it's part of education at the, the early school level. Um, and she has offered uh, an educational map with pedagogical materials, including instructions for users to make their own anatomically accurate 3D pr printed clitoris, right? So that's all available um, with, uh, on uh, her website. Um, so amongst scholars, uh, there's a long tradition who have been of scholars who were no better than doctors or artists in their failure to acknowledge, investigate, represent, or produce knowledge about the clitoris. Um, as Malibu notes, uh, in the entirety of Michel Foucault's uh, Histoire de la Sexualité, the clitoris figures one time, one time. Uh, and it was not really until you have feminists such as, uh, starting with Simone de Beauvoir, who began to name feminine uh, sexuality and that this organ began to figure in philosophy. So she spends time in, in the course of her book um, over these uh, scholarly interventions, acknowledging uh, the pioneers who sought to bring the clitoris into discourse. Uh, starting from uh, Françoise Dauteau's work in psychoanalysis, 
the radical Italian feminist Carlo Lanzi, um, her activism in the 1970s, and Luz Irigaray's uh, thinking of feminine bodily specificity. Um, so uh, given the history of this, and given some of the critiques that people like uh, of the second one feminists, one of the um, important um, elements for Malibu to, to negotiate in uh, Le Plaisir et Passé is um, avoiding the, um, uh, the charge of essentialism. Um, so while she's tracking uh, the emergence of this new form and undoing the unthought, uh, she does avoid, uh, I think, getting uh, drawn into um, the quagmire of essentialism, which especially in the U.S. was became was really a grounds for rejecting a lot of the French theory that had been very important, and then it became kind of um, re um, rejected uh, through social constructivist theories of gender. But here, um, Malago is wor working her way nimbly between la femme et le féminin and allowing us to acknowledge the significance of uh, this historical moment for women's bodies um, without getting trapped in this essentialist uh, quagmire. So she makes it clear in the text that the clitoris is for everyone in as much as the feminine exceeds woman. Right. So we, we, we're going beyond that. And she walks a line of acknowledging and honoring and denouncing women's pain and suffering, and, and in her discussion of the clitoris, that has a, an important part. Uh, she has two chapters on uh, what is called in English feminine genital mutilation, in French, um, mutilation sexuelle féminine, so interesting distinction there. And uh, her book was, in, she says, inspired by Lars von Trier's film, Nymphomaniac, her film, the film from 2013. Um, so she's uh, dismantling anatomically determined conceptual schema and respecting bodily plasticity. Um, so, as I said, it's not easy to conjugate le féminisme, la femme et le féminin, uh, but she, I think she succeeds to do so in an inclusive gesture, the recognizing differing needs, desires, and bodies that are both trans and cis, uh, while acknowledging a long-term history and effects of violence. And all of those pieces need to be part, uh, part of this. So in the slides that come, I've got quite a few uh, quotations from her work that I think will help um, um, maybe be useful for our discussion. So here, uh, she's claiming, Le féminin est d'abord un rappel, rappel aux violences faites aux femmes, hier et aujourd'hui. Le clitoris est évidemment, et à beaucoup d'égards, le dépositaire. En même temps, le féminin transcende euh, la femme. Uh, let's see. So um, here we have a somatic rendering that recognizes the plastic materiality of bodies. Um, and I'm going to, the argument I'm going to make here uh, really comes out from a, a bringing together of Malibu's ideas and certain ideas of a particular translation theorist, Douglas Robinson. So unless you're very invested in translation theory, that may be less evident, but for me this seems to be an interesting meeting point. So um, one of the, the goals Malibu has is, is to explain why it is that woman endures as a necessary concept in a time of gender fluidity and of um, where we're taking apart those types of concepts. And she says, il y a évidemment disproportion de visibilité, d'où la nécessité de faire revenir toujours le fantôme, c'est-à-dire la réalité du féminin. Uh, so she's arguing that the feminine bears the mark of pain borne by the clitoris, even as this suffering is detached from an anatomical determination. So in contrast to an omnipresent masculine, this concept is distinctive in that the ghost-like revenant uh, challenges the phallocentrism of philosophy. And so she's going to claim and introduce here une zone clitoridienne du logos. So the clitoris in this sense is a uh, supplement that supplements deficiencies in existing paradigms uh, and their inability to fully represent the human. And in so doing, it forms a phantom limb that acts as a significant reminder. So she says, 
le féminin peut se définir comme ce qui vient après la dénaturalisation de la femme. Sa hantise reste irréductible, la violence des gestes qui tentent de l'effacer le transforme immédiatement en membre fantôme. Uh, so this is this notion that I'm, I'm still really working through here, uh, the question of the phantom of the feminine. Um, so this is the article that, uh, that I was referring to by Douglas Robinson. It's called uh, Proprioception of the Body Politic, Translation as Phantom Limb Revisited. So it was written in 2006, and he's actually going back to an earlier work that he wrote on translation as a phantom limb here. But essentially, the argument that he's making, in, in a nutshell, is that translations function as a prosthetic means of access to the foreign. The difference here is that um, uh, proprioception is usually defined as the body's ability, which is essential to us, uh, to sense its own movement, location, and action. Right? It's linked to the, the inner ear. Um, without this, we don't have a sense of ourself in space. Um, but Robinson differs because he makes proprioception limited not to a single body, but one that can scan the whole interactive body that might be touching us, the body that includes other people. That's a, a quote from him. So for him, he extends proprioception from the individual to a social context. Um, and he also significantly is <coughs> arguing here that the phantom limb is uh, something more than a metaphor. Um, I'll come back to this question of metaphor as it's something that haunts a lot of my thinking. Um, but here it's a theory that explores the materiality of translation. And the thesis that, that uh, I'm gonna propose is that a clitoridian perspective contributes to a collaboration between Robinson's proprioception of the body politic and the sensations, including prosthetic extensions, that a translational practice can provide. Uh, so the connections here are uh, the feminine as the phantom and the phantom as uh, translation, as sort of a, a chain of connections. Um, so one of my, uh, when we're translating, we're always discovering new things, and one of my discoveries was the work of Carla Lonzi, um, uh, the uh, radical Italian feminist from the 1970s, whose work is, is not recognized, although will soon be. She is being translated uh, now from Italian into English, um, and I think she's not yet translated into French, uh, but I think that, that there's definitely a time for us to come back and look at the important uh, work of second wave feminists such as uh, Lomzi uh, and to promote their translations. Uh, what I find interesting is that um, her book, uh, La Donna Clitoride e la Donna Vaginale e Atriscritti, which was from uh, 1974, uh, when scholars are uh, writing about this, uh, they often use the word clitoridian. And then we have in English the adjective clitoral, but clitoridian seems to be making its way into English to um, connote not just a, an adjective, but rather um, a specific, uh, distinctively feminine political existential power and potential. So I'm really interested in how that, that new term is, is making its way. Um, in Lonzi's work, she's contrasting the vaginal woman, who she says uh, is subjected to patriarchy, to the clitoridian woman, who achieves self-actualization through consciousness raising. Um, so what I like in, in this book, uh, Manobu's book, is that rather than just dismissing the second wave um, of feminism, she's offering tribute to the ways that it has contributed to thinking women's pleasure. Um, so what I'll do now is turn to the feminism of today, which is responding to the, the digital revolution that is ours. Uh, likewise, digital art is ringing in a very different era, uh, one in which the image turned anatomical model becomes uh, what we might think of as a 3D printing insurrection. I'm sort of inspired here by the, the theorist Paul B. Preciado, um, uh, whose book, um, uh, I'll be now turning to in this next section. So let me see, I'll just, yeah. Uh, so the Countersexual Manifesto, which was written back in 2000, it's a long time ago. Again, there was a delay in uh, really the appreciation of this body of thought that is absolutely of our moment. 
um, and has just been translated in 2018. I think in his states, uh, Preciado's work is going to really um, elicit a lot of interest. Uh, and um, in the foreword, Jack Halverston uh, uh, quotes uh, a, a section in uh, this countersexual manifesto where uh, Preciado says, we are the revolution that is already taking place. A very powerful statement there. Um, and if I look around, uh, certainly in the context where I'm, that I live in, in the States, this is the revolution, definitely. This, this is the revolution taking place. Um, and there's a quote here uh, where Preciado is describing, this is a book about dildos, about prostheses, so prosthetics coming back again, and plastic genitals about sexual and gender plasticity. Um, and uh, so this is really the move that Malibu has been uh, diagnosing, this shift from the graphic to the plastic, uh, recognizing new regimes of, uh, that are appearing from an altered materiality and altered bodily, uh, bodily relations. Um, so uh, Preciado gives voice to the dramatic ways in which anatomy is being rewritten, rewritten, starting with how she, Beatrice, the be there, so Beatrice, is now he, Paul. Um, so uh, he starts um, diagnosing a, a radical change in the materiality of script. And I, I think this, it's a rather long quote, but I think it's really um, quite magnificent. So this is what Preciado says. We will soon stop printing the book and start printing the flesh, thus entering the new era of digital biowriting. If Gutenberg's era was characterized by the process of desacralizing the Bible, sacralizing knowledge and proliferating vernacular languages against Latin, then the bio-Gutenberg 3D era will bring forward the desacralization of modern anatomy as the dominant living language or code. Soon, we will be able to print our sexual organs with the aid of a 3D bioprinter. Uh, it all seems very futuristic in some ways and also very current in others. Um, so arguing that there is no natural body, but rather we are all already technologically plasticized, and I think that argument is a, an argument well, well taken. Uh, Preciado uh, uh, draws our attention to a new conception of anatomy. Um, and so to go back to my connection to translation here, um, I've suggested that translation two is epigenetic, that was when I was drawing on that notion, by design and default, open to environmental shaping and plastic transformations. As an art that shapes human communication, even as it adapts to technological inserts, we need a translation theory open to recognizing how we work in tandem with artificial intelligence as our prosthetic brain. So, um, I, I, although I think of myself as an artisanal translator, I, I'm beginning to recognize increasingly how artificial intelligence is a kind of prosthesis, uh, and I think we're all doing this increasingly. And, and, you know, we're adapting very rapidly to these habits um, uh, without even having the time to, to think about that. So to reconceive a thought in terms of prosthetics is to enter a fundamentally vulnerable space. Um, one where the gesture is that perhaps of seeding power. We might feel super powerful with our smartphones, but we also know that there's a kind of seeding taking place. Um, and uh, rather than, than seeking totalizing control. So while futuristic technologies are associated with a fear of totalitarianism, and, and we are so super sensitive to that in the middle of this pandemic, where we are increasingly, in a sense, controlled by our passes and our QR codes and everything else that, that defines our life now, uh, and that gives us the things that we want to, to be part of our freedoms, but a rethinking of our tech relationships may modify the perception and the resistance it elicits. Uh, I'll say that this is the strategy that Malibu adopted in her postscript. So she wrote uh, Morphing Intelligence, but by the time it was translated into English, she wanted to write a postscript to that. Uh, so in the English, there was a postscript where she corrected the political ambitions of the brain metaphor that, that was proposed in uh, What Should We Do With Our Brain? 
and acknowledge that we are intelligence morphed, that our transformations exceed us and that are beyond the conceit of control. Uh, so uh, technologies such as brain-machine interfaces, BMIs, uh, whereby scientists have found a way to translate human brain activity into text, so going directly, like why would you go through your hands? That seems so old-fashioned, right? <laughs> um, are as they are developed, this tendency will be further accentuated. Um, so only a philosopher who's willing to unthink can come up with a type of recalibration to the conundrums of the fastest revolution in history. Do be aware, that, you know, the one that we are living is, there's never been one this fast, right? So if you feel a little overwhelmed some days, there's a reason for it. Um, it's, uh, so um, this revolution can produce, uh, Malibu claims, une indifférence à la maîtrise. Uh, and when, uh, I'm really looking forward to this next book already, uh, Malibu's next book will be on anarchy, I hope I'm not giving away secrets there, but um, that's really uh, where her thought is going next. Um, and indeed, we have a, a, a foretaste of that in uh, Le Plaisir de Passer, when she uh, has this unforgettable statement, Le Clitoris est un anarchiste. Um, so, um, the question of control, domination, and alternative modes of interrelation, all of which are also central to uh, a gender analysis, I think, is at the heart of Malibu's thinking. And it finds its way here uh, in Le Plaisir de Passé in a reconceptualization of the body, starting from the assertion that the clitoris uh, est rapport au pouvoir, mais pas rapport de pouvoir. I've put it in French there because the English translation I'm still working on, that's a, that's a tough one and so important to get right. Um, so, um, let's see. So just uh, the thing that I'm working towards here is the notion of clitoridian translation. So for translation, the clitoridian offers a useful terminology for distinguishing the history of the abuses of power. So let's remember, translation is integral to empire uh, and to many other forms of oppressions, right? We're not gonna idealize translation by any means. Uh, but we are going to see in it a capacity to enter into alternative power relations that would also involve alternative translations, alternative translation strategies. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm going to um, move into uh, just the last few pages. I think we're okay for time here. Yeah, we're fine. Okay, so um, in uh, Le Plaisir de Passer, uh, Malibu's focus is on bodily plasticity and somatic shaping. And she updates her intervention in philosophy, remarking, J'admets aujourd'hui être plus, moins intéressé par la traque du phallocentrisme dans les textes que par l'exploration du pouvoir de façonnement somatique de la philosophie. Uh, and actually, the most exciting sentence for me while I was translating, um, and I, I told the other class earlier this morning that when I translate, I don't read the book ahead of time. I just, trans the first draft I translate as I go, I want to see how the argument is unfurling. And when I came to this sentence, it was really a, a big thrill. Um, when she speaks back in a way to Dick out and every other philosopher who has erased the pleasure and pain of the body, and including the brain, when she says, entrer en philosophie et entrer dans mon corps, on finit par se confondre en une même expérience. Il est évident que je n'ai plus le même corps depuis que je pense. That's a great line, right? <laughs> Il est évident que je n'ai plus le même corps depuis que je pense. Really, very exciting, I thought. Um, and uh, this was something that in our uh, master's in, in translation this morning, we had a little mini atelier discussing uh, the textual explosion of the point médian uh, or what I'm calling the punctuated pleasure of the clitoris in the text. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, in this book, um, uh, Malibu does not use uh, écriture inclusive in any uh, systematic way, but on 15 occasions in the text, and notably in this uh, quotation, um, she uses it to point to the ways in which our bodies and pleasures are plasticized. 
Um, one of the interesting questions going, taking this book from French into English, uh, because English has a lot more um, expressions which would be ibisen that are gender neutral, uh, do I just go straight into that or do I recognize the effort of the French to, uh, of, of this écriture inclusive? So that's really, um, I enjoyed talking about that with the class today and if you have other uh, comments here I'd be interested to hear what you think. Uh, so this is the quote from her, uh, L'effort fait pour fluidifier mon désir, enrichir mes relations sexuelles d'autres partenaires, non seulement réels mais aussi virtuels. Et puis, we also said, how do you even pronounce that? What, does, what happens to écriture inclusive when you're speaking it? Uh, virtuel, logique, textuel, a aussi façonné mon sexe. La fait vibrer, palper, euh, palpiter, exister d'une façon inédite qui n'a rien à voir avec une sublimation. So um, we're not in the artistic sphere of sublimation. This is body plasticity seen materialized. And so far from the objectifications of art and its removal of areas of knowledge and experience through sublimation or uh, the object, we arrive in a plastic realm that palpitates and modulates as it gives, receives, and explodes form. And we arrive then at a punctuated pleasure of the clitoris in the text. So I'm seeing these um, point médian as a tiny clitorises appearing throughout the text, if you like. Um, uh, I, I mentioned my concern, uh, and this is really a kind of philosophical question about um, the use of analogy and metaphorical comparative thinking um, as an insufficient um, mode for thinking about um, uh, concepts. So um, Robinson's theorization of translation as phantom limb, I mentioned his comment that it must be more than a metaphor, and that uh, effort to avoid an analysis that functions through analogy is something that haunts Malibu's work as well. So when she's rethinking Kantian philosophy in terms of epigenesis, um, uh, she uh, stops herself and says, you know, if this is just analogy, it's, it's just not enough. It has to be constitutive. We have to be talking about what it is. Um, so the, the, this intervention where the brain that thinks is one that is formed by the philosopher's practice. So an analogy is insufficient as a mode of understanding in both philosophy and in translation studies if it is to grasp its own constitutive process. So translation must resist the temptation to use metaphor to engage with materiality, uh, and that's very hard for translation to do because we just have a million different metaphors for translation, and it's so much fun coming up with them. But it's not really enough for the grounds for a theory. Uh, so to engage with the plasticity of the body, brain, uh, uh, and clitoris included. So. Um, just as uh, Malibu's thinking shapes her body, as she says, um, and uh, an eroticizing discourse as philosopher, the work of translation too results in a somatic shaping. Uh, so what is it for the translator? And that, could, that somatic sh shaping might be a traumatic one. There's many, many translators who are working with very different material, uh, very difficult material, and um, who, you know, are such and so as a result, have a kind of secondary level of trauma from that effect of translating, of transiting um, uh, the words of other people. So the question is, how does the thinking of translation differ from the thinking, thinking of philosophy for the body? So what's the difference about thinking philosophy or thinking translation? Uh, the content and mode differ, and this specificity does require uh, recognition. There is increased research on how a translingual, transcultural practice forms the brain in ways that are distinct, especially as compared to bilingualism. So translation studies scholars such as Maria Tomaszko in 2012 and 16 uh, have turned specifically to neuroscience, recognizing the need to map the implications of the, um, uh, let's see, um, the implications of, um, of the interfer interface of brain plasticity and translating. So I'm not going to talk about that here today, but I did want to uh, mention that since we are uh, thinking about these aspects of the body. Um, 
So I can acknowledge that thanks to new technologies such as functional magnetic resource imaging, um, it is now documented that translator and interpreter brains are different. So in a time of artificial intelligence, thinking about our own intelligence and how we shape our own brains, what you are all doing here at this university to your brains at a physical level uh, is particularly interesting and important. Um, so uh, translator and interpreter's brains are networked as a result of habitual use, developing not only particular structures that are often oriented interestingly to the left hemisphere, but there's also a strengthening of the efficiency of the caudate, which is the part of the brain that coordinates goal-oriented tasks. So for translators who are intrigued by the meaning-making process, uh, Jeff Watts has explained, and here's a quote, that the caudate is involved in the intentionality of an action in its goal-directedness. Not so much in carrying it out, but in why you're doing it. So I think the first thing people think about with translators and interpreters is language not why they're doing it, or, and yet that is the part of the brain that is being affected by the training and practice of translating. So the shaping of the caudate nucleus through training offers maybe a basis for translation assessment, uh, which is always a big question, how do we assess translations? Showing how some intentionality is more effective for a given target than uh, other approaches. So it's not just language skills that are honed. Uh, for as Brian Zeng comments, Training on the brain is not specifically linguistic, but involves a variety of domain general executive functions. Um, okay, so how does translating shape the brain? How does it feel? Uh, the neuroplasticity that intrigued Malibu from her very early engagement with this type of change, and uh, she was quite, uh, that was one of her innovations because um, continental philosophy was not really engaged in science, and that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to draw neuroscience into her thinking. Um, so if this is how the translator brain works, we still have to ask, how does it feel? What does it feel like for the translator? Uh, for while it is an intellectual practice, it's also an effective one, especially since its very structure, it is a relational art. So Malibu's candid explanation that philosophy is not just a matter of the mind invites a similar investigation of the erotic and effective impact of translating. Uh, this is her comment on philosophy. La philosophie ne travaille pas les corps en vertu de visée orthopédique seulement. Elle n'est pas qu'un dressage, elle sculpte aussi une érotique qui permet de nouveaux branchements entre énergie spirituelle et énergie libidinale. Je ne parle pas d'une sexualité idéalisée ou métamorphisée, mais bien d'un effet sexualisant du discours. Um, that's something I think it, that invites uh, consideration in the field of translation. Um, so I'm going to go back now. We started with uh, Sophia Wallace's uh, art, but I'm going to go back to uh, the visions offered by contemporary artists of the clitoris as the grounds for a new thought uh, which works because the unseen is revealed. Um, this is the, uh, an artist, Laura Kingsley, who made um, globally in many different countries these uh, chalk drawings, such as this one uh, right here, uh, as street art. And um, she reported that it took 20 passers-by before uh, this drawing was correctly identified by a doctor. Um, which was interesting. I don't know if the same thing would be the case for a penis, but let me just, I wonder. Uh, and then in 2017, there was a clit art festival in London. Um, and then here we have the glitterous, uh, which is Ali Sebastian Wolf's giant sparkling 100 to 1 scale anatomical model. It's interesting how many of these artworks really still emphasize the anatomical aspects. It's like we're bringing it into sight. We're not yet um, doing uh, abstract representations. Uh, so this was used as part of a um, uh, performance art piece, which was performed by the Clitorati at the Sydney Opera House. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to close really by uh, finishing with uh, Sophia Wallace um, and her art. Uh, this is some street art, some graffiti that she has been uh, doing. Um, and 
so I, what's interesting in, the, in her work is that she is um, rendering the clitoris form sacred and according it both the respect offered by a gallery space with uh, installations such as Fleur de Clit and Clit Damask um, uh, and the attention garnered on the street with the graffiti art. Um, and then I think I'll probably end up here uh, with this work, Because the Truth is Sacred, um, where she uh, gives the clitoris a kind of sacred space that it has been excluded from and sort of defined in opposition to. So I hope that I've shown uh, in uh, this oh, sort of wide-ranging overview the way that thinking the clitoridian offers a plastic queering of paradigms and pla practices. Um, as a fundamentally feminine pleasure that also offers a new path for a path for new studies in translation and opening perhaps to a clitoridian form of translation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I will be asking a few questions and then I hope the floor has, has questions as well. Um, so I, I just thank you very much. This was very uh, rich, very diverse, and so I have lots of you know thoughts. Um, so just to start off, I was um, thinking uh, about the notion of plasticity in relation to collaboration, and I was wondering um, does the notion or the concept of plasticity plasticity help? Um, uh, think about translation as a collaborative art. That's a great question. Is there a way that we can turn the light off on the... Per, on, um, oh, yeah, I guess. If we, um, yeah, yeah, if we just, turn this off? Yeah. So just there's a little blinding. Oh, yeah, that's much better. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I should... Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and it's not one, funnily enough, that I... It, although it seems quite obvious that I've talked about that much, um, even though all of my translations are definitely collaborations with the author, um, Every time I'm translating one of uh, Catherine Marago's books, we have a, a, a really lengthy exchange. I normally get to a certain point where I feel like it's ready to show it to her, and then she, she'll, she, because, I mean, in some ways I think, why do I, am I even needed? Um, but, because uh, she speaks and, and writes perfectly well in English. But, um, so she will then uh, come back to me with, with different, um, thoughts and, and, and responses that are invaluable. But I do think that uh, because plasticity is all about shaping, molding, giving, taking, that it, it just lends itself absolutely to thinking about, uh, about collaboration, for sure. Um, uh, and, and I think that that goes, that, that's something that's much wider. I think more and more, uh, the ability to collaborate instead of the ability to um, want to control and determine and define. I think in, probably in your classrooms, a lot of your projects are collaborative processes because we know we need to learn how to do that, right? Uh, taking control and being the dictator really is very limiting. Um, and so a practice that starts from the very basis that you can't do it without some kind of exchange uh, is, is useful, and, and that's precisely where uh, I think this is valuable. Um, we need to be able to be plasticized by our collaborations. We need that uh, give and take. Yeah. Um, and I have another question that has to do with the title of the book, uh, which you, you showed two titles, actually. Um, one which is a sort of calque of the, the, the French, mm -hmm. uh, Erase Pleasure, Clearest, Clearest of, of Thought, something mm -hmm. like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Or The Clearest of yeah. Thought. Yeah. And another title, and uh, there's an alternative title, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, includes the word unthought, mm -hmm. which, I thought, which uh, I thought was really interesting because it helps understand what is uh, meant by Manabu, of course, but also in the word erased, mm -hmm. that you know has not been thought of as other elements have been thought of in biology and science um, relating to the, the, the male body, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, you know, why, what was happening there? Right, yeah, thanks for asking for that. Um, and I was excited when I finally got to that title. And, I, and this is an example of collaboration. I had come up actually with alienated pleasure 
Um, and Catherine, and I had reasons for that, but Catherine was like, no, it's not that. So I was like, okay. And then she said, but I know you'll come up with the right one. I'm like, okay. And then, um, as we know, our thinking is connected to our bodies. And often if we need to make a breakthrough in thinking, uh, the best way is to get off the computer, get away from the table, go outside and move, right? So I was actually on a bike ride. It was the morning before I was coming here. And I was coming, sliding down the hill. I was thinking about the cover, which I don't really like. And then the, the idea of unthought came to me. And I, I liked it because it seems, uh, because it's not good English, right? So that's kind of nice. Um, and it seems to do the work of uh, describing all the things that are unthought. Like unthinking is an active process. And I think in, in gender studies, we're hyper aware of the many, many ways that there is this work of unthinking. Uh, it's not that we actually have never noticed or never, but there's this active work that, of repression and of um, putting aside something. So uh, it came up out of, as a, because I needed a solution um, to, to, uh, to the title. Uh, and I think that it's something that I, I will continue to, to work through. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah. Uh, we have questions from the floor. Um, I don't think the, the cord is very long. But, um, Thank you very much for this absolutely fascinating talk. It's um, new horizons for me as a translator and as a, as a translator scholar. I have two questions which both have to do with the issue of the visibility of the translator because it's something that, it's not central to your talk, but it's, it's, it's something that, that comes up. First of all, um, was it easy for you to um, negotiate with the publishers uh, the presence of a preface? It's not very usual that uh, translators be given the, the right, the place to, to, to insert a preface, especially in the US where um, translators are, are particularly invisible. I, I guess you're aware of the movement uh, of translators at the, time, uh, at the moment. American translators are asking for uh, their names on the, the book covers. Uh, so that, that, that's my first question. How, how do you um, um, get a, a, a publishing um, house to, uh, to accept the very uh, presence of a, of a translator's preface? And then um, how, as, a, as a, a, an academic and, and a translator, do you negotiate this, um, this um, well, let me rephrase that. I know that um, uh, there used to be a time, because I have read articles about that, when uh, academics in the US were not to say they were translators as well. Because okay. it was uh, seen as um, uh, not research and uh, as hampering their, uh, their work as researchers, as, as scholars. Okay. So um, as have things changed uh, on American campuses uh, in academia? So these are my two questions. Thank you so much. These are all things that I love to talk about. Uh, it's my own uh, translator activism at work here. Uh, so with regard to the preface, um, I think it makes a big difference that I have a super supportive uh, author and that Catherine has always backed me on this. Uh, so I think that may explain, because it's a little, I agree, it's a little mystifying that I managed to put them, they're not really even, uh, I mean, I. What they are is I will pull out themes that are in the, in the book, but I'm not writing about the book, I'm writing about translation. Um, and they're not those kind of apologetic translator prefaces where you say, I'm really sorry for this terrible thing, I did my best, and I made these problems with these, I had these problems with these words, which is super boring. Um, so I think that uh, I, maybe I've been lucky, maybe it's sort of under the radar, I don't quite understand how I managed to get the bike, because that part has been okay. And I have to probably say it's because Catherine has been supported in that regard. Um, with regard to um, getting my name on the cover, and, and I do this, and it's, you know, it's always embarrassing. You're like, oh, I'm not that important. It doesn't matter. But if you do it for other people uh, on the grounds that we need to recognize the work of translators, it becomes easier. Uh, and so I am currently in that discussion, and that is something I have had to argue with, much to my frustration. Uh, because I keep bringing it up, in the end, the publishing houses have 
usually accepted it. And I do, I have, I have another bee in my bonnet, which is I wish that they would put what language it's translated from. It doesn't matter, you know, it does matter that that is signified. Like, at least, could we at least acknowledge that? Um, in Kathleen's case, uh, she was working at the University of Kingston. The blurb on the back were all from UK and US uh, academics. Nothing showed otherwise that this was a translation, and that's dishonest. Um, it's more interesting that it is a translation. So uh, that, that is definitely a, a, a battle with uh, the publishing houses, more interestingly than the prefaces. So that, that's an interesting kind of uh, distinction. With regard to the place of translation on US campuses, um, this is a really interesting phenomenon. For the past 10 years, I've been uh, running a lecture series at Smith College, um, which has been extremely popular, very successful amongst students. And of course, and everything counts, it's all about how many students are in your classes. Um, I normally have 70 students, and they're speaking 20 plus languages, which is my favorite place to be. I, I love being in that environment. Um, and one of my strategies has been, as well as inviting uh, scholars from outside to come and speak there, to find all the faculty at Smith who are doing translators, translations. There are lots of them, and you're quite right. Translation, if you wanted tenure, was not something to uh, talk about. Please note, I don't even have tenure. Um, so I have a certain freedom uh, as a senior lecturer uh, in that regard. Um, certainly in my French department, they don't really want me talking about translations because they want me to be really focusing on French and immersion in French and to kind of forget, you know, go for the goal of the native speaker and forget that there's another language in the room. But I won't because actually I find that's really interesting. Uh, and I think that we need to think about multilingualism and stop um, kind of ceding the, uh, the rights and the, the prerogatives to the dominant language in the room. It happens all the time. I want to know what other languages are in the room. I don't want people forgetting those. Um, I think, I, the, so I would say the answer is in some ways, uh, U US institutions still would raise an eyebrow around uh, translations for tenure. At the same time, translation is such a fascinating thing to do, and lots of people are doing it, especially once they've got tenure, faculty love to do translations. Uh, students love to do translations, and what better way to really engage with material? Um, so a lot of, you know, the students are very, very interested in, in translations. So that's a lengthy uh, uh, answer, but it's a question that really, uh, that matters to me. I am so happy to be here in this environment, uh, because one of the kind of paradoxical things about translation studies is that it tends to be very nationally bounded, which is ironic to say the least. Uh, in other words, the US translation studies tends to be discussed with other US translation scholars and then that traditology um, sometimes has its, and, and we need, there really needs to be an effort to understand the multiple translation theories that exist all over the world. Uh, there are actual uh, networks of uh, translation scholars and, and international conferences there, yes, exactly. they, of course they do. Um, the, the question though is wh who are they referencing? Which, uh, which translation histories are they referencing? Uh, anyhow, I know that we're in a gender studies <laughs> space and so I'm, I'm going off a little bit too much on the translation here. But um, yes, uh, thank you for that, those questions. Those thank are, you very much. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was uh, fascinating to me. Um, how did you, uh, first I'd like, can you tell us when you, when you started translating, translating Maya Boom, for instance, you didn't speak about Les Nouveaux Blessés? No, no, unfortunately, I, well, not unfortunately, um, fortunately, because she keeps writing faster than we can translate. So there were, there were many other translators. Yeah. Um, Les Nouveaux Blessés, I, no, is it, it is translated. I, I know that there were six other translators okay. um, were, who've been working on her work. Um, I started in 20, 2007, was, was when I started, but there, was, there were various other, uh, and Peter Scoffish, I love his prefaces, he has a great preface um, uh, on the Heidegger change. So um, anyhow, so there, there are other people who, as well who are translating um, her. And what about, I was, um, um, I'm not a translator, I'm just mm -hmm. a scholar in mm -hmm. American literature. 
and uh, I was uh, struck by your uh, the, the way you described yourself as a feminist translator, which was uh, visible in your presentation. But I mean, uh, did it come? Did this uh, uh, label come to you? If I may say so, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, did it come with the, the translation of Balabou, or was it something that you you felt mm -hmm. if you identified with? Mean, yes, you experienced over right. here. Can you clarify this? Um, no, this actually comes, I think the feminist comes far earlier. That, that's really the starting point. And then once you're a feminist, it comes into everything you do. Um, so uh, I would say that the feminist translation, I was already doing translations that had uh, a feminist orientation in as much as I was trying to um, do translations by women, uh, uh, by women authors. I wanted to uh, share and promote women's voices. Um, and I was uh, looking for strategies, but I think the point where I started uh, really I, working through my thoughts as a feminist translator was actually translating Marie Vyoshovi, who's a Haitian author. Uh, that book is not, that it's a literary text, it hasn't yet been published, uh, but it was in that process that I started doing a lot of my uh, research and thinking about uh, translation from a feminist perspective. Um, so it actually predates my work with Malibu, uh, for sure. Um, it just happens happily that uh, there's a nice alignment in many ways between that and her work. Yes, yeah. Are there any other, other uh, questions from the floor? Um, I have a question that maybe, well, if you don't want, don't, don't yeah. want the answer, just don't. Um, it was about rapport au pouvoir and rapport de pouvoir. Mm -hmm. What's your draft right now? What's your translation? I mean, it's really interesting. Um, I think it's a relation, a power relation, but not, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I will let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you. Because I, I'm going between two different things. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Um, Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming. And uh, let's thank again, uh, Carolyn Chad. Okay. Yeah.